Welcome back to another edition of the Edge Podcast. Publisher Brendan Slaughter here for BeaversEdge.com. Joined by Beaver's Edge writer and KEGO radio host TJ Matthewson. We're back here with another edition of the podcast. Took the off week last week with the bye week. TJ got a little vacation. The Beavers got a little R&R to work on some things. We kept things rolling here at beaversedge.com. And we're back with another podcast to uh, preview this weekend's matchup against Arizona. It's going to be a battle. Huge matchup down in the desert for Oregon State and the Wildcats as the Beavers and uh, uh, Wildcats will take a, or take on at 7.30 p.m. First 7.30 p.m. kickoff of the year. It's going to be a little Pac-12 after dark action TJ, good to see you again, man. How are you? How was your uh, little excursion to the East Coast? It was nice. It was, it was good to get to recharge. I actually didn't look at a single Beaver thing the entire week. It's you would be surprised, mm-hmm. you know. You, some people live live and die with this stuff, and then you, you take a week off and you realize, oh, actually, this is slightly more interesting than when I left. So, right. The, uh, and you, the, the and concept, you can... the concept of work life balance is really, it's really remarkable. And you can attest when when I was gone during the cow week, I did my best, but I was still kind of, hey, how are things going, fellas? So it, it's it's it can be hard sometimes to turn that switch off. But glad you got some downtime, buddy. Yeah. And good to have you back for sure because we got a big football game to talk about this weekend. A huge game. Oregon State comes off the bye week, as we mentioned. Uh, the bye week knocks them up in the rankings too. They go up to eleventh. Uh, in the AP poll, moved to 12 in the coaches, so rise up one spot respectively in each. And that's always good, TJ, when you can move up in the polls without doing anything. And that was the way of a couple upsets, some teams in the uh, bottom half kind of moving around a little bit. But we'll get more into the uh, uh, Arizona side of things a little bit later in the podcast as we'll uh, have a special guest from our Go AZ Cats uh, site and the Rivals Network joining us as well. But, TJ, you got a chance to talk to the offense and the defense this week. What were your kind of some of your big takeaways on what they were working on during the bye week? I think we kind of know the obvious ones, defense being the run defense and tackling offense. You know, Jonathan mentioned just kind of tightening up some things, some procedural stuff, you know, maybe some of those nagging penalties that appear at odd times. But it really seems to me like the Beavers came back really refreshed and focused from watching and talking to them this week. Sounded like they got – the week off for the most part they had a couple practices they practiced uh what i think sunday night but otherwise Mm -hmm. i think they might have had just one other practice during the week is really sort of a a rest and recharge again like us taking taking some time Mm -hmm. off they they got some time off to to sit back after uh, after seven weeks of the college football season and Mm -hmm. take a breath and and get ready for what will be five of probably the most important weeks this program has played in quite a while long, if if, long. if if ever so it, it was good it's everyone seemed like they were in a good headspace I think you did mention it with the offense I think the only real thing was the procedural penalties otherwise I, I don't know if the offense wanted a week off I mean they're they were yeah. playing so well that yes. you you'll wonder you know how, how are they how's the rhythm how's the energy going to be down uh down in Tucson to start against a, a really good Arizona team and uh, a defense that's been playing pretty well the, the defense, I mean, that was pretty much all the questioning today is how do you guys tackle better and how do you stop the run? Because you know what Arizona does? They run the ball pretty efficiently. They're not a heavy yeah. running team per se, percentage-wise. But the, when they do run it, they're they're pretty effective. And they ran for five touchdowns against Washington State last week. So it was made a big emphasis over the bye week, even though, you know, these guys can't tackle. You get The only live tackling they get is beginning a fall camp. That's it. Right. So you can't you can't practice this. And they said, you know what? We just got to perform on the field and we got to make sure we're in the right spot. So we have the best option to go do that as well. Did seem like a very, you know, upbeat, as you would expect, group of guys that we got to talk to. Most importantly, man, isn't it cool that we got to talk to Aiden Childs finally? Oh, awesome. True freshmen never get made available ever, ever, ever across the board at most universities. True freshmen right. are not allowed, not allowed to talk, but for the first time, the 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 athletic communications department at Oregon State let Ian Childs come out and talk to us, and it was a nice seven minute conversation. Talked a little bit about his about his decision to to come right. to Oregon State, his relationship with Jonathan Smith, playing next to DJ, walking around campus, getting recognized, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really engaging conversation. If you haven't seen it already, go check it out on our YouTube page. Really Definitely. just phenomenal and good to get to hear from him and got both quarterbacks for the first time. Yeah. 
No, that I mean, that's as good as you can ask for coming off a bye week or as a media personnel. Selfishly, I always love to talk to quarterbacks. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because I was thinking back when I was texting you because when you said we got Childs yesterday, I was like, wow, OK, that's that's significant, as TJ mentioned, for all the reasons he mentioned. And then I started to think about it a little bit. And I was like, you know, if a player is in their freshman season and involved enough in the offense, like I think back to last year, it wasn't. I'm trying to think the first time we got Damian Martinez, right? Same kind of thing. Because Damian Martinez was a true freshman last year. And I remember as the year went on, we did get to talk to him. So I think it's a very case-by-case basis, especially with guys who are becoming more and more a part of the rotation. Because, again, Childs has been in the quarterback rotation, even though it's a series, still in it for some time now. And eventually you're going to have to you know, allow him to speak on that. So, again, as TJ mentioned, fantastic interview. Go check that out at beaversedge.com. Uh, But yeah, I mean, I think more than anything, TJ, the bye week came what seemed like you mentioned the offense maybe didn't want to slow down. But from a uh, a take a step back perspective, I think it did come at a really good time and particularly for the defense. I mean, the offense, as we mentioned, I think there were some things, but really exiting or exiting or entering the bye, excuse me, you really felt good about everything that you saw. TJ mentioned you really didn't want to mess with anything. The passing game had started to come alive. The running game was doing its thing. The pass blocking had gotten better. But you really started to see some some holes on that defensive side. And, and TJ, you know, kind of going into the advanced stats a little bit, you know, that we were able to look at during the bye week, you know, Oregon State was one of the worst tackling teams in the country through seven games. Like there were 133 FBS teams. I'm pretty sure – It's changed a little bit in the week, but they were floating between, you know, 117 and 125, which is just, uh, you know, horrific, right? You just, you you look at that and you're like, huh, teams with this mark don't have this record and all that stuff. So thank, you know, for, for thankfully for Oregon State's sake, it hasn't impacted them too much, TJ, but that tackling really stood out as kind of the biggest thing. I think the run defense a little bit less because I think, one impacts the other not being able to tackle well Mm -hmm. has led to more yards on the ground and you know that kind of surfaced against Washington State not being able to tackle receivers in space that surfaced against Cal not being able to tackle their receivers or running backs in space so it's going to be interesting to see if they can put together a better defensive performance on the road TJ what's your confidence level in that talking to coach Bray this week Well, he's always confident, which is never a worry. My confidence level, we've watched this team play on the road in Pac-12 play twice this season. I know they're two worst defensive performances of the season. And it just so happens now you're going to be playing in what will be your one of your tightest Vegas spreads of the year. I mean, the line's down to three and a half in this game. So Vegas is seeing, well, these two teams are not really as far apart as you might think. And when teams are that close, yeah, it's the tackling that much more important. You can't afford to have a bad tackling game now. So I really don't think that there's an option but to have a good game because if they have a bad tackling game against Arizona the way the Wildcats are playing, yeah, well, uh, like that's not good. So that, that's, that, the- that if we're talking about this five week stretch and. Well, they right. got to take care of business this week, especially because the next two weeks, you know, the Beavers will be at least a 10 point favorite, if not significantly Indeed. more against both Colorado and Stanford. But you got to take care of business this week. If you ever even want a shot at those final two right. weeks, that can right. really put you on the on the map and on the national championship path. Absolutely. And, you know, you, Jonathan Smith mentioned it on Monday during his press conference. You know, TJ, I'm sure you heard it down the line when he mentioned, you know, we want to play meaningful games. We want to play in meaningful games in the end of the year. And to play in meaningful games, you have to take care of business during the season. So at the end of the day, it's close, but I still think Oregon State is a better team than Arizona. My question is, who comes out of the bye stronger? Because, again, we talked about Oregon State's offense maybe didn't want to have the bye. TJ, I don't know if Arizona's offense wanted to have the bye week with what they did to the Cougs up in Pullman before they went into the break. Yeah, 44-6, to six, five rushing touchdowns. Their defense, by the way, has also been playing significantly better. They like they managed to throw USC off a little bit. The, the, of course, that score looks a little bit more lopsided. I think they gave up twenty seven or twenty eight points in 
in regulation to USC, which it was USC's offense is, yeah. yeah, I was going to say for USC's offense, it's pretty significant because you get, you know, you'll get an extra 14 points sure. each. Oh, no, sorry, 15 points each because you have to go for two in the right. second overtime. And that inflates the point totals a little bit. So the, think about Arizona's offense. So they they play within a score of Washington. They play within two points of USC. They honestly probably should have beat USC. Uh, I agree. How the Trojans that, that have game, fared in the in the yeah, in the weeks that, after that. That game and then they go been, on the yeah, and go they ahead, go on the road and they beat Washington State uh, uh, in the same environment that the Beavers were sort of blitzed upon and ended up losing their only game of the season. Like. Man, that's dangerous, isn't it? Right. I mean, uh, totally. I mean, the only when I look at their schedule, TJ, the only game that gives you some confidence in the last month or so was when they opened Pac-12 play and beat Stanford by one, right? Mm-hmm. So, because we know Stanford's not great, but hey, you know they beat Colorado, so give them their give them their give them their flowers, as they say. That but that was the uh, went... that was the last game Jaden Delores started, by the way. Right, and so then if, if you just if we just want to look at you know Noah yeah. Fafita. Yeah, like that's well, we, where that's where the things really start turning around a little bit, right? And that kid's a stud. And like I said, we'll learn a little bit more about him in our second segment when we bring on uh, um, uh, a writer from our sister site at GoEasyCats.com. But again, you mentioned Fafita getting that start against Washington, lose by seven, right? Washington, I something with the Arizona schools in Washington, man, because Washington looked. Not so great in that game, and then looked like crap this last weekend, too. And, TJ, I almost wanted to text you, but I didn't want to. I knew the time change. I didn't know if you'd be up, and then I didn't know. Oh, I was if, up. <laughs> yeah, and then I, I didn't know. I'm like, does he really want to talk about this? But, no, he's probably want the time off. If, if you didn't like, think we were paying attention, we were. You know how weird is it to be, like, going home from an establishment, and there's still games on? It's, kind of, it's so weird. It's so weird. Yeah, Anyways, that was off topic. But, no, no, it's totally on topic because, again, I, I, I know you love your Sun Devils, TJ, but a competent football team that's not in year one of a rebuild would have beat Washington last yep. week. That's how bad Washington played. And I was just, uh, you know, uh, just flabbergasted, for lack of better words, at how much different Washington and really how that hangover game hit them Big time after or after the win over Oregon, and who knows, they might be back to being elite this weekend. But that just kind of shows anything can happen on any given weekend in this league. And you know, I I, I think it's going to be a, a great battle between two teams, TJ, that really want this game. And you know, Oregon State obviously is chasing something more. And like you said, there's an opportunity these next three weeks against winnable opponents to take care of business and then set up two huge, massive games at the end of the year. Um, real quickly before we uh, break and uh, uh, continue on with our second part of the segment, pre- previewing um, the matchup with Arizona, TJ, what are you looking forward to the most in these final couple weeks? What what do you need to see from Oregon State to kind of show that they can compete for the Pac-12 title? Do they need to convincingly win against Arizona, convincingly win against Colorado, convincingly win against Stanford? What tells you that they're going to be on that path starting Saturday or not for that when, lack of better terms, whether or not they're playing great defense. Like yes, if we're talking, if we're talking about the Beavers, like w- making it to the PAC 12 title game, that would, that would also, that would lead into them also playing again for that CFP spot. And if you're going to play for a, a spot of that caliber, I mean, we need to see not only the offense can continue to do what it, what it has been doing, but, they need to like step it up on defense. And I mean, significantly yeah. what what they did the last two weeks doesn't win you a Pac-12 title. Like you, you're going to play Michael Penix and have yeah. that kind of, have that kind of defense and then play Bo Nix and one of, one of the most balanced teams in America and the Oregon Ducks the week after. Yeah. That's right. That's a tall task. If your defense isn't playing that well, and especially we're going to need to see some good defensive performances on the road. Just, Probably just like one. There, like give yourself one. Yeah. a semblance. Give yourself a semblance that you can bring the energy on defense on the road. We haven't really seen that. I mean, San Jose State at the beginning of the season. I don't know if you can really count that. That was so right. long ago. But the, the last two data points we have, they've been pretty poor on defense on the road, and they're gonna have to play good defense on the road to go win this conference. Oh, absolutely, and I, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's gonna start this weekend because, as TJ mentioned, and we both mentioned. Arizona's got a 
fantastic offensive group and Jed Fish is starting to turn that program around. You know, it, it, it had been, you know, very much a rebuild, obviously, when he came in there and he started to get him to play good football. They've got playmakers. I mean, I think of McMillan on the edge. He is a stud. I mean, I got a chance to watch that USC game in, in pretty much a lot of that game that night. And I walked away saying Arizona won that era. Arizona won that game. In my opinion, USC just happened to win on the scoreboard. And that was kind of the big feeling I had, you know, obviously that means nothing. A, win, a win's a win, a loss, a loss is a loss. But at the end of the day, I thought they played outstanding and it was impressive. So Oregon State will definitely have their hands full. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a break. Quick intermission here on the Edge podcast. We'll be back uh, previewing the Arizona Wildcats with part two of our podcast with GoAZCats.com. Welcoming you back into the Edge podcast. Publisher Brendan Slaughter here with TJ Matthewson continuing our preview of the matchup with the Arizona Wildcats. We bring on Troy Hutchison from GoAZCats.com, our sister site down there in Tucson. Troy, welcome to the program, man. How are you? And thanks for uh, joining on to talk a little bit about the Cats. I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Doing pretty good. You know, not quite as sunny as uh, your nice background you got looking there. A little more gray mm -hmm. and cloudy up here in Oregon today, but we're doing good. We got football back. TJ, uh, how about yourself, man? How are things? Oh, I'm doing great, Brennan. You know. Getting into the matchup itself, Troy, what are kind of some of your first initial thoughts on this matchup? And kind of give us a little summation of how Arizona's season's gone so far uh, up until their bye week. Yeah, you know, I think coming out of the gates, people were surprised at how well the defense for Arizona had been playing and coinciding with that, how poorly Arizona offense uh, has been going in terms of Jaden Delora turning the football over four times, total of five times against Mississippi State. Um, they just couldn't seem to get things rolling. And then the injury to Jaden happened. Uh, Noah Fafita steps in and has a great performance, not only against Washington, but USC and Washington State as well. Um, it's kind of rejuvenized this Arizona offense for Jed Fish and the Wildcats. And then defensively, uh, like we touched upon it earlier, uh, they've been a big surprise. Johnny Nansen, if there was a Pac-12 Assistant Coach of the Year award, He'd probably be one of the front runners this season. Um, they've gone from a defense averaging over 209 yards on the ground against them to under 100, uh, which is top 25 in the country. And their secondary, even though they've only gotten one interception, they've held uh, not only Caleb Williams, Michael Pettix, and most recently Cameron Ward to one touchdown between the three of them. So uh, defensively, they have everything rolling right now. Yeah, what about, what what's think? the biggest... Uh, oh, sorry, I'll say but between the, the two quarterbacks, I think that's the, the biggest story that people mm -hmm. are going to try and figure out over the course of the week. What, what's been the biggest thing that's changed in the offense, if any, between, you know, Jaden Delora and, and Noah Fafita? Is it turnovers? Is it the, I guess, lack of turnovers from from Noah? Are they better through the air? What, what's the biggest difference? Yeah, I think it's decision making. You see when Jaden's under duress, he wants to make the big play. He's circling around. He won't just take the easy five, six yards and get out of the chaos there. Where Noah, he reads the pocket very well, uh, reads the field, makes a quick decision and kind of just eliminates those issues. And then you've seen throughout this course of time where he's had opportunities to maybe fit it in the tight window in the red zone to get a touchdown or throw the ball downfield and he'll either run for four yards or take the check down. Um, some fans don't love that, but that's what you get with Noah. And I think he's just very good at decision-making where Jaden um, kind of has that Jay Cutler in him where he doesn't see a window <laughs> that he doesn't like. And it leads to turnovers in games where you have three to five picks. How's uh, do? Is there an idea on his health? I know Jed Fish said on Monday he said we're going to wait and see until Saturday night. If you mm -hmm. were to give a guess, would Jaden be available? I think Jaden would be available, but I don't think he will be playing. Um, I think after the Washington State game, you saw kind of Noah had that big explosive game where 350 yards, no touchdowns, but. You're beating a top 25 team on the road, 19, uh, number 19 at the time, 44 to 6. It's hard to pull somebody after that. I think what Jed would have liked to have happened is get the win, and then, you know, you can play your 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 guy that you brought in and kind of have a, a shorter leash with Jaden. But right. now it's kind of forced the hand where uh, you have to go with Noah. Speaking of Noah, I mean, just talk a little bit about 
coming in as a redshirt freshman, I mean, what he's been able to do and against ranked teams and ranked competition, I mean, um, I haven't got a chance to watch a ton of Arizona games from start to finish this year, but one that I did was that USC game. And I was telling TJ just before we brought you on, Troy, I really felt like in everything but the scoreboard, Arizona won that game. And, mm-hmm. you know, if it, you know, play it over again, what have you. But that was kind of my my thought in my head when I'm like, okay, I think USC is not quite as good as everybody thinks because at the time, you know, they were still undefeated before they played Notre Dame and obviously lost this last weekend. How has he been able to be so efficient and just so calm as a young quarterback in a league that is just stacked with quarterbacks? And you mentioned winning all those, you know, at least in the stats, winning some of those head-to-heads with those big-time quarterbacks you just mentioned these last three weeks. Yeah, you know, I think everybody who's covered the team has sensed that presence from Noah from the moment he stepped on campus. Mm. Um, You know, during my time, I can't remember a freshman quarterback that went out there and was able to read a pocket even in, you know, spring practice and even into training camp um, and just have a good feel for the game and make quick decisions, make right decisions, and even be willing to throw the ball away if nothing's there. Um, there is something different about him, and you saw it carry over into this year for him. And, you know, you just had that feeling once he got his opportunity that he'd kind of stay there at that starting job. But um, I thought probably it would be next year because I didn't anticipate Jaden getting hurt. But I think this is honestly a blessing in disguise for Arizona because now you kind of have a calming force. Um, mm. I think everybody might trust Jaden a little bit. I mean, might trust Noah a little bit more uh, in terms of with the football, if you're the players around them. And another part of that is there's a lot of kids from Servite High School on this team for Arizona, Jacob Manu, uh, Cam Burnett, and Tetero McMillan. They played with Jaden, I mean, with uh, mm-hmm. Noah. So obviously they've had that mm-hmm. connection and he's had a chance to work with some of the younger guys on the team last season who are now making big impacts on the field this year. A couple other interesting things that I, I thought stood out. I mean, first of all, not a, not a very highly touted recruit. Second, mm-hmm. he's, you know, he's like Russell Wilson height. He's not that tall, <laughs> right? 5'11". Yeah, 5'11 on a good day. Yeah, <laughs> with that's TJ on. with that's that's TJ yeah. with some with some risers on for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, and you know, I like the Russell Wilson uh, Russell Wilson comparison because I do see that. I think he's got a lot of Russ in terms of yes, he can beat you with his legs, but it's more about his presence in the pocket and finding guys downfield. What's so, been the biggest thing on the for the defense to, for Arizona really turning it around? It's Kind of, you don't expect, I guess, from an Arizona Wildcat program or, or team that their their staple is their defense. But here they are, and they're top thirty against the run overall. Which, if we're looking at the matchup with Oregon State, is probably where you want to be strongest against UCLA mm-hmm. and and Utah. Both had great run defenses and really hampered the Beavers' ability to to go all out on the running game and force the quarterbacks to beat you. And I think that's going to be another case on Saturday. So really what's been the case with that with that defense is is it bigger bodies on the defensive line is it is it scheme what is it I think it's a multitude of things and you know going back to the day Arizona was known for its defense back in the Mike Stoops and Dick Tomey era and they yeah. did that through Polynesians and Simone players that came into Arizona like Joe Tafoya uh Joe uh Joe Salavea and players like that And Arizona kind of went back to those roots. They got Johnny Nansen. They got Coach Kafusi, started recruiting those types of players again. And, you know, last year they had their growing pains. They played a lot of sophomores and freshmen down the stretch of the season. Um, But you bring in some big bodies up front like Bill Norton and Tyler Manoa. That kind of seals the middle for you. And then you go out and get Dwayne Aquina. And this coaching staff, I think that has been huge for Arizona. They showed the flex defense against Washington State. That's a Dwayne Aquina special. And it starts up with the front seven, front six, if you want to call it, whatever they're running that day. Um, Not only Bill Norton and Tyler Manoa, but Justin Flo as well. You get him from Oregon. You go Mm -hmm. and have a guy like um, Isaiah Ward develop, Russell Davis develop, Tai Tai Ugalele develop. Uh, They're just developing guys. They're getting guys in the transfer portal. And right now they have a system where they're going – eight to 10 deep on the defensive line and they're just rotating guys in and out. So everybody's fresh come the fourth quarter. 
And speaking on that a little bit, just expand a little bit on the offense with with Jed Fish. What do they like to do? Where does Arizona particularly, you know, like obviously they're a pretty balanced offense kind of looking at the numbers for the most part, pretty similar to Oregon State in that regard. But first, is there one thing that sets up the other? What, what do you think? When is Arizona at their best offensively? I think what Jed Fish wants to do is be a high-powered passing offense. You saw it last year when they were in the top 10 of passing. But I think he learned from last season there were opportunities where they could have ran the football and they chose mm. to pass and it kind of hurt them down the stretch. Um, and this year it's been more balanced. Uh, you look at Arizona's backfield. Michael Wiley will be back probably this week for Arizona. You have Jonah Coleman, DJ Williams, and Ray Sean Luke. They're four deep. Yeah. Um, and you're running behind that offense line, which is right now one of the best in the Pac-12. Um, you got to give it to them. And right now Arizona's at its best when it's establishing the run, especially up the middle, wearing teams down, and then letting Noah kind of pick teams apart. Um, as things break down. But uh, if you're in that third and four and shorter, that's going to be success for Arizona. And so is this an offense that <clears throat> could if they need to, because the big thing for Oregon State is, I mean, they've given up over 500 yards on the ground in the final two weeks before the bye. Is this an offense, as you mentioned, how deep the, the running back room is? Like, is this an offense that could really just go run heavy if they needed to? I think so. I mean, it all really comes down to how Jed's going to call that game, sure. you know, whatever particular week it is. Um, he does like to go more pass, but you saw last week against Washington State. Yes, Noah put up 345 or 354 yards, whatever the number was, but they ran the football. DJ Williams had, I think, two rushing touchdowns. Coleman had three, and a lot of those were untouched uh, touchdowns because they were able to run the football and break teams, uh, break Washington State down. And then when they got in the red zone, it was easy. Um, so just knowing your personnel, it kind of just plays each week for Jed Fish and this coaching staff. For sure. And and kind of going on the other side now, it's kind of hard to see with, with how well they've played in these last recent weeks. But what are some areas of concern that Arizona is still working from? Troy, what, what are some things that they are still – trying to dial in and maybe there isn't a lot after a big game like 44 to 6 over Washington State but is there anything that coach Fish has talked about particularly the last two weeks that they worked on during their bye week or that next step in any particular regard they want to take you know I think over the course of these last two weeks, the talk's been more about Oregon State. But if you're looking from the film, I would say red zone offense in terms of execution and not settling for field goals. They settled for quite a few field goals against USC. Same mm -hmm. with Washington. Uh, just being able to put the ball in the red zone is something that they've been working on since last season. And then uh, third down offense. Last year, they were pretty good at it. I think over 50% last year. This year, they're under 40. Uh, they've struggled in that situation. Now, a lot of that has been with Jaden behind center. Um, I'm not sure. sure exactly what the numbers are with Noah behind center and has improved, but if you can get in those, you know, third and manageables, um, that's going to help out your offense, but just making it where you're not relying on the pass to beat a team. Um, and then lastly on the defensive end is just execution in the red zone. Arizona has been really good in the red zone defensively this year. And I know Oregon state's been really good in the red zone on offense. So I think that's going to be a big thing this week and see, you know, what, what gives in that area. Ultimately uh, Oregon state comes in as a three and a half point favorite. The over under in this game is 56 and a half should be a great weather around game time. What are you mm -hmm. expecting in terms of the atmosphere uh, down at Arizona Stadium after having a couple road games and then, you know, obviously a triple overtime loss, but a game where Arizona played well and then a great game up on the road to Pullman. What do you expect from the atmosphere at Arizona? And then ultimately, what are kind of some of your early thoughts on how this matchup is going to shake out? Yeah, you know, I think Tucson's a unique city where – they need to see good football before they start buying in, at least consistently. Uh, growing up here, I know back in the Mike Stoops days, it was a sellout all the time, but there was a buildup there. There weren't so high expectations. Um, I think it's going to be a good crowd uh, come Saturday, around 47, 49,000. I don't know if they're going to reach that sellout number. I think it might have been sold out if the game was last week instead of that bye week sure. in between getting the sure. hype for the game. But, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a good game. Um, last time Oregon State was in Tucson, they were able to run the ball at will. And I don't think we're going to be seeing that come Saturday night. I think this is going to be a very grinded out game that goes under. Yeah, no, I I would tend to agree. You know, I think it's going to be a, a 
you know, I was telling TJ, I think it's going to be a, a good matchup between two teams. I mean, TJ, what are some, what are your early, uh, you taking the, uh, taking the under in this one? I, it's tough. <clears throat> I think I'd lean over, but it, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I think I'd lean, uh, you know, I think I'd lean over too. I mean, I, I, first of all, I, I just to turn around on the Oregon state defense, probably need to see a little bit more. And again, they've, they've really, sh- the Oregon state defense has really not shown much on the road to make you think sure. they're going to, they're going to they're going to turn around which is one of their keys here down the stretch they got to play better defense on the road however given given the information we have i would lean that you know arizona's going to have some success on offense and this oregon state offense i'm going to i'm going to be honest facing that arizona defense really great matchup but the amount of balance and structure this offense currently has in it i'm not sure how many teams defend it so i feel like that leads to leads to a little bit more of the over i would probably lean slightly oregon state since they're the better team but you know, it's. I think it's gonna be a phenomenal game. I think this game is chaos written all over it. Seven thirty o'clock kickoff in Tucson, nearly in November. It's Halloween on Tuesday. I mean, what more could you ask for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's gonna be a, a fantastic matchup, and we'll obviously keep previewing it here at BeaversEdge.com this week. Uh, Troy, big thanks for jumping on the podcast and uh, chit chatting with us. Uh, enjoy the game this weekend, and uh, uh, everyone that's listening this podcast, make sure to uh, tune into BeaversEdge.com and GoEasyCats.com as Troy and I will be exchanging some more insider information on the Beavers and Wildcats uh, in our uh, behind the scenes story this week. So definitely make sure to check that out. And uh, stay tuned to BeaversEdge.com for TJ and I's predictions on the game and uh, much, much more leading into the matchup. So, again, big shout-out to Troy Hutchison for joining us on this edition of the Edge Podcast. Thanks, as always, to TJ Matthewson. This is Brendan Slaughter signing off.